So Laura, you're from San Diego. Uh, you grew up in San Diego. Your family has a, an amazing catering business, Becker's Catering, which we've used quite a few times. So you grew up in hospitality. Tell me a little bit more about your upbringing. My family owned a restaurant and I always say my, my parents believed very strongly in child labor. Um, <laughs> so they put me in work at a very young age, starting at four years old, I was a hostess and at 10 years old, I was a dishwasher and 12, I was waitressing and um, I planned events with my mom and literally did every possible. I worked on the line with my dad. I mean, literally every possible job you could ever have in the restaurant business. I did um, from a very young age. I had like a two page resume by the time I was in high school. <laughs> um, and my, my dad was a chef and my mom was the front of house. So that was a business model that I understand, understood um, very well, like a, you know, partner owned, married and having a business together. Um, and then my grandpa was a chef and my grandma was the front of house for their restaurant. Uh, so my grandpa was a, a cook or the, the cook or the chef on a submarine in the Navy. Um, and he had a super big personality and they always kind of used to tell the story that um, they have like a three-star general come through, but on a submarine, the chef is in charge and even above like a three-star general because they're in charge of feeding everybody. So mm -hmm. that kind of like went along with his personality. So my grandpa, uh, that's how he came to San Diego. He was um, in the Navy, got out of the Navy here, uh, went to San Diego State for business and then um, did what what he knew, which was cooking. So he opened the first restaurant on Mission Gorge Road. Um, in Grantville, um, down there on, on Mission Gorge in the E. And he had that business. His, my grandma did the front of house. He did the back of house. My dad and his brother grew up in that business. And then, of course, my, um, my dad did the same. And now my brother has um, taken over the business. And my brother and my mom run what is now a catering company and my brother's wife has come to work in the business. So definitely a lifetime of hospitality folks. Okay. So how did you go from a restauranteur family to law school? I always knew that I wanted to be a lawyer since I was five years old. I said, I want to be a criminal prosecutor. I think I, I don't know, saw it on TV or something. So I told everybody, you know, I'm going to law school someday. Um, and then I went to Long Beach State and I uh, was a communications and women's studies major. And then I applied and I went to law school in Washington, D.C., which is GW. Um, and I, I remember like the first week I got to Washington, D.C. and I felt like relaxed and comfortable for the first time ever. Um, growing up in San Diego, people always used to say to me, oh my God, you're so intense, you know, and I, again, I, I have a big personality and I was always kind of like doing stuff and uh, people would be like, you're so intense, chill out, you know, and I, I went to DC and people were like, oh my God, you're so chill. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I'm chill, you know, um, so it just, um, the speed of being in a city, the ambitiousness of being in, in law school and surrounded by people who were hustlers was really kind of something that um, fit what I was looking for. So um, I had an amazing experience in law school and like a really weird person who loved law school. Um, and after school, I clerked for a judge in the DC Superior Court. And then I went straight to the United States Attorney's Office for the District of Columbia. Um, and that was my ultimate dream job of being a criminal prosecutor, like I had said, since I was five. Um, and getting to be in the United States Attorney's Office in Washington, D.C. was essentially like the most amazing possible thing you could do as a lawyer um, mm -hmm. because you are a federal prosecutor. So you have the training and the resources of the federal government behind you, um, but you also get to practice local crimes in Washington, D.C. So they mm -hmm. prosecute both federal and local crimes. So there's big fraud and wiretapping and, and big cases on the federal side. And then they also did local crimes, everything from, you know, misdemeanor stuff all the way to homicide and, um, you know, every type of violent crime that happened in DC. So that was my really goal and dream to get there. Um, and so after a few years in the office, I went to the homicide section and um, then for the majority of my career in DC, I was a homicide prosecutor. 
Mm. And it was amazing. It just was like the best, it, you know, my life was basically like out of a movie. Um, the cases were the biggest cases in the country and um, on the front page of the Washington Post. And, um, you know, so I remember one time I had a Washington Post reporter that like followed me to court to see what case I was going to get. And oh. I thought, this is really a cool job, you know? <laughs> um, and so I was in DC for 10 years um, and I was in the US Attorney's Office there for about six years. Um, one year before I left DC, I got in a really serious accident and I broke my back. Mm -hmm. Um, I shattered my spine in a kind of a freak boat accident mm -hmm. and, um, I had massive surgery and had to come back to San Diego and kind of rehab and my, I was in a back brace and everything. So, um, so I came home and my parents were like, you know, you've been in DC for long enough. Um, and like, you've been there almost 10 years. It's time to move back to San Diego. Um, my brother had had one kid and, um, mm -hmm. And they just were like, come on, move home. And my dad denies that he said this, but um, I maintain that he did. He said, you've played lawyer long enough. You should come home and run the family business now. Oh, <laughs> and he, he, he was like, I never said that. I'm like, you did say that. And I don't know if he was joking, but I was like, you know, what? I'm not really playing lawyer, you know, having one of the most prestigious legal jobs in the country, prosecuting homicides on behalf of the federal government, but okay, you know. So I came back to San Diego for about a year, uh, sorry, for a few months while I was rehabbing. And, um, and I met with the U.S. Attorney's Office here. And um, I guess a credit to people who live in San Diego, but not great if you're a prosecutor, there just wasn't enough crime here for me. Mm. Um, and I thought, you know, I'm really at the height of my career in D.C. And I don't think I'm ready to, to come back to San Diego. So I was like, I'll give myself a year. And if I don't get the case of a lifetime or some other reason that keeps me in DC, you know, forever for the rest of my life, I'll move back to San Diego and build my life here. Yeah. Um, so I went back to DC and I got very quickly the case of a lifetime. It was mm -hmm. a missing eight year old girl. And um, it was a, a very huge case in DC. It was on Nancy Grace and it was on the, you know, Washington Post. And it was, it was really a, a uh, exciting is the wrong word because it was a yeah. you know, tragic yeah. case, but it was it was really a sensational case in DC. Um, and super long story short, the suspect ended up killing himself. Mm -hmm. And so, as a prosecutor, that makes your case go away. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, I guess I will sort of take this as a sign that mm -hmm. you know this would have kept me there, but it's not. So I applied to the U.S. Attorney's Office in San Diego and made the decision to move back. Um, so I came back to San Diego and it's shockingly about 10 years ago now. Mm. Um, yeah. So I came back to San Diego and I joined the United States Attorney's Office for the Southern District of California here in San Diego. I had a friend um, that was a couple and the wife was a lawyer and the husband, I would say, was a, sort of a serial entrepreneur and was doing business stuff all the time. And um, they were my close friends in San Diego. And he said, I, I have a business idea and I'd like you to be my business partner. And I was like, what? No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even interested in doing something else besides what I'm doing and have a great life, you know? And he said, well, hear me out. Craft cider, I think is going to be a thing. And, um, you know, San Diego has kind of had enough of IPAs and there's people looking for something different. And this is a great place to start a craft beverage business. And, you know, I have this idea and, and I'm like, why do you even want me to be your business partner? Like I'm a lawyer and not even a relevant type of lawyer. I'm a criminal lawyer. Like I have nothing to do with this. And, um, and he said, well, I don't know, help me raise some money and help me do some of the marketing and the branding and let's design this brand and see where it goes. And, and what then, year is this, Laura? That was probably 2016. Okay. And, um, and I said, I don't think I'm even allowed to have another job working for the federal government. I said, why don't you go find out? So I went to my supervisors at the U.S. Attorney's Office and I said, this guy wants me to be his business partner. And they were like, and what? I'm like, a, a cider company? And they're like, what will you be doing? I was like, I think I'm going to wear like a, a this cider t-shirt and sell it, sell it at the <laughs> farmer's market or something. Yeah. And this was kind of like before influencers. 
Yeah. But I, in my mind, I was like, I'm going to be like an influencer. I'm going to tell my yeah. friend to like drink cider and it'll be cool. And that's like whatever. And he was going to be the entire operator and just carry the business. And I was just kind of like the hype woman. Yeah. And they said, how many hours a week will you dedicate to that? And I said, you know, 10 hours a week max. And they said, yeah, you can do it. And I was like, okay. So <laughs> I went back to him and I was like, they said I can do it. And he was like, all right. I'm like, what do we do? He's like, well, let's get started and see what happens. Um, so we really dove in and um, we had started with the name Bivouac, which means temporary camp. Um, and temporary camp and that word, it's used by um, people in the military and it's used by mountaineers and hikers, campers, uh, climbers. And that was kind of my lifestyle anyway. I was like rock climbing and paddle boarding and hiking. And, you know, I kind of grew up in that way, being in San Diego, always uh, involved in outdoor action adventure. And the word bivouac kind of evoked this like wanderlust spirit, which for sure I always had that. Um, and so there was something that took me um, or like inspired me about the brand. So as we started designing that, um, I got super into it. And as we started to raise money and then people I knew put money into it and we were getting more involved, more involved. I was like, this is actually like a, like a good idea. I feel like it's going to work, you know? And, um, so I went to my parents and like, I, I didn't have any money to invest. I just had this little tiny piece of equity for helping to like design the marketing or whatever. Um, but I kind of thought to myself, like I'm doing all this work and I'm putting all my, my effort and energy and resources into it I don't want to have no stake in the business um so I went to my parents and I said hey you guys I'm doing this thing and I'm like I kind of feel like it's gonna work and um my dad said I would never invest in a random guy's cider company ever <laughs> um if you are saying and, and like I said I think my dad always had this um vision of me being an entrepreneur because that's what he was his dad was you know everybody in our family is entrepreneur so I think me working for the government was like I don't want to say a failure but it was it was a departure from the like entrepreneurial yeah. spirit that I was raised with yeah so my dad said you know if you're saying that this is a project that you want to take on and that you're going to see through to the end um you know I'm willing to to consider it or think about it but you can't change your mind and go back to BC and be a lawyer. And, um, you know, if you've got to see this thing through, I don't know this, this other guy that is doing the business. I know you. And so, um, he kind of made me sign in blood, you know? Yeah. And, um, so my parents ended up investing a little bit of money into it. And then other people that we knew, um, just, you know, community oriented. And that was kind of the time that, uh, craft, beer you know businesses there was yeah a lot of people were were investing in craft and um it was a thing that people knew about in san diego for sure yeah so we ended up raising enough money to at least get started and so we found the location in north park and um when we found that location we kind of sat down and my family with its background in restaurants we said we better put a restaurant in with this tap room mm -hmm. because um, cider is new, not too many people know about it. And we don't really know if it'll work, but we know that food will work. We know that people, you know, understand, come in for, for food. And then we'll say, by the way, we have this cider that goes really well with food and we can yeah. engage in that whole education experience. So it's kind of funny to do like a restaurant as a backup plan, yeah. you know? Um, but, but for, at least for me and for sure for my family, we saw it as like a thing that we knew we could make work. Yeah. Um, so we found a location in North Park and we opened and we had a restaurant and we designed the brand. And And I was still working full time as mm. assistant United States attorney in San Diego. Um, yeah. And I never intended for this to be my full time job of any sort. Like I loved my job and I never wanted to leave it. Um, and so then it got to the point where we opened. We got really big, really fast. Um, and we got picked up by a distributor like the day we opened, which is wow. totally crazy and never happens. Um, yeah. And we were, got a ton of press and a ton of media and we had this cool chef and we just opened really big. 
Um, and to be fair to my now ex-business partner, I think it became a very big project very fast. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, the idea of a business and putting together a business is a lot easier than the execution of a business. Yeah. Um, and restaurants are hard. I mean, they will chew you up and spit you out. And if, if you don't, if you don't know what the pace is and what the issues are and everything. Okay. So, um, so it became a really big project really fast. And I found myself working, you know, all day at the U S attorney's office. More, more than the 10 hours you promised. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it wasn't even like the physical hours. It was like the mental, like, Oh shit. You know, people I know have invested in this and my name is on it and my family's, you know, reputation is on it. And, and just like me, I like to do things well, you know? And so I'm like, we came out epic. We've got to make it epic. Um, so, uh, so we went through and we were doing pretty good and things were growing. Um, and, but it became very clear that the business partner was it, it, not able to handle all of the things. Yeah. Um, and so I'm like, oh no, what am I going to do? Um, and at the same time at the U S attorney's office, um, there was an election, the administration changed, and my job became a little bit different than it had been. I'd been with the U.S. Attorney's Office for a decade, um, and I tried, you know, 60 cases and prosecuted homicides for the federal government. Like, I, I had a very amazing career, and it got to the point where I didn't really see um, the growth in that office and the way that I kind of envisioned before. Yeah. So I, but for both things happening at the same time, I never would have left being a prosecutor because I loved it so much. Um, and I certainly never would have opened a restaurant and <laughs> um, gone to do that full time, but it's, you know, kind of circumstances were what they were. So I said, I'm going to put in my notice at the U.S. Attorney's office. I'm going to come get bivouac kind of squared away. And then I'm going to go back to being a lawyer and, you know, maybe be a defense attorney or go work for a firm or something else that former federal prosecutors do. Yeah. And um, so I came to bivouac and dove in and, um, and the business partner and I were kind of butting heads a little bit about how to work things out and how, you know, what the proper course of the business would be. And then COVID hit. Mm. and the whole world shut down and um I was like okay I went from having a salary <laughs> and a business to no salary and no business no inertia no money no health insurance no nothing like the whole world you know just imploded um and I was like well that was a that was a terrible choice I just completely destroyed my life and my career um and then a little bit into COVID, um, and this is sort of a, a very long story, very short, but the business partner was like, I'm going to go on a trip. I'll be back in a week and we'll figure it all out and we'll, we'll work out what we're going to do. And I was like, okay. And then he left and he never came back. <laughs> um, it's it straight up. It has never set foot back in San Diego and, oh, um, fun. just cut all ties, um, yeah. And, you know, his name was on the lease and the liquor license and the LLC and the bank account. I mean, really, it was, it, 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 it was disruptive yeah. <laughs> to say the least. So we're in the yeah. middle of COVID, business partner gone, all these legal issues to work out. And I was like, cool. I just destroyed my entire life. <laughs> okay. And how much of the business did you on paper uh, own? What was your equity at that point? Um, so at that point, I think I had 10% of the business, okay. um, and it, the irony of it all, I went to apply for like the PPP and those loans that were coming out, um, yeah. at, during COVID and, um, and I did not own enough of the company to put my name on the application. And yeah. so I was literally like running every single part of this business and, you know, from sales and distribution, restaurant, tasting room, I mean, like literally every single part of it. 
And, yeah. um, and then I, I couldn't even put my name on the application to save the business. It was, I was like, this is crazy, you know, and, and take into consideration, like I could go to a law firm and make, you know, half a million dollars, million dollars a year, like, you know, yeah. that would be totally normal. All, most of my friends are making in the realm of a million dollars a year. Yeah. And so I, and I had no, no money, no job, no nothing. And no, not even enough of this company to like save the company. It was totally crazy. It was unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. And how much at that point when he departed, how much had you raised for the business? Um, well, we had only, we raised money at the very beginning, which right. was, you know, how in 2016, we raised money. We ended up opening the business in 2018 and then okay. 2020 is when, uh, the world shut down. So, um, we hadn't like raised more money between them. So originally we raised, I want to say, um, we did some like trade of equity for services um so I want to say it was probably like $750,000 of cash and then like okay. maybe another 250 of um of services but I'd have to kind of dive yeah. into the cap table but somewhere around there okay. what is your advice to other people that are stepping into launching a business maybe a similar type business who are considering a business partner what is your advice to them yeah of things to look out for. Yeah. <laughs> I, good honestly, writing. I think about this every day. I think to myself, if I was teaching a class and at an MBA, you know, at a business school, um, and it was a class on entrepreneurship, what lectures would I give or what lessons would I teach or how would I describe the crazy few years that I've had? I mean, I, I always tell people like, if nothing else, I've gotten an MBA in the last, you know, seven years or whatever. Um, so this was, you should definitely just go to Harvard because this was way more expensive than that. <laughs> um, but what, um, in terms of like a business partner, um, I reflect on this all the time because, you know, if we fast forward to where my life is now, um, I, this is a lot for one person and it, and I, I'm really handling way more than one person should handle. And it would be really cool for a whole bunch of reasons for me to have a business partner that I could look to and either be like, this is fucked up, <laughs> you know, <laughs> at least we're in it together. Yeah. Or, um, hey, could you handle this while I handle that? Or these employees are bullying us. <laughs> Let's stand up to them together, you know? Yeah. Um, so because I grew up in the business model where my parents were both married and business partners mm -hmm. and my grandparents on both sides had that same situation and my brother and his wife had that same situation. That is a business model that I understand really well. And I, there's obviously um, a lot of cons or a lot of potential pitfalls if you're doing business with your partner, of course. But the thing that I think that that can be very successful is that when you divide and conquer whatever issues that come up in a business, which are many, um, and you have a business partner who is completely aligned with the end business model or the, the vision for the business, and in, in the case of people that are married, you're completely aligned on where the money is going, right? And so um, so even if you're like fighting about the, the road to get there, you know that the end goal is make money and that it goes to the same house. The yeah. issue that I see presented in a lot of situations, and I think ultimately was probably presented in mine, was at the end of the day, you might agree on things, you might disagree on things, but the money has to be divided at the end, or the goal has to be divided at the end. And so it's very hard to find another person who you're not related to in some way, um, where your interests will always be aligned for the for the end, the end product or end result. Yeah. The places where I've seen it be very successful and where I've thought about it being very successful, um, and obviously entrepreneurs talk about this all the time. Um, number one is to find somebody with a totally different skills than you and that your skills complement each other and that you um, that you're being self-aware is like step one to everything. 
and yeah. being self-aware as to what your skills and what your weaknesses are and how that other person complements them. So when I see partners together that are very successful, um, you know, my mom and dad, we always joke about this, but my dad is the cook. My mom's the like organizer and planner and operations, right? And we, they would always say throughout my life, if they switched jobs, the company would be a freaking disaster because my mom cannot cook and my dad cannot be in charge of talking to people and selling stuff and like, you know, planning a wedding, right? That would be like a nightmare. Yeah. And so having people in the right roles for themselves and having those people very self-aware of what their roles are, that, that allows you to divide and conquer without conflict. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think some of the um, challenges that my business partner and I um, had at the beginning were that there were some similarities mm. of the um, what skills we believed we had. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, it's it's not who's right or wrong. It's like who you know prevails in the end. Yeah. Um, yeah. but like if if we both think that we're good at marketing, and we have two ideas for a commercial or a marketing campaign and like who decides which one wins or which one yeah. is the one that we roll with or whatever, right? So if you yeah. have the same skills and the same interests as the person that you're in business with, that's a recipe for disaster, which is kind of like the opposite of what you think, right? Like if you have two front of house people are gonna start a restaurant and you're both like, oh yeah, this is great. We both are managers of restaurants, we'll be, we'll crush it. Unfortunately, that ends up being more of a problem because anytime there's a disagreement, there's no like deciding factor, right? And yeah. I take everything, everything back to being a lawyer because that was my training, that's my my education, my experience, my personality. But in court, you always have the you know one side, the other side, and then you have a judge that says, okay, this side you know wins or this side's the right the right one. Um, it yeah. doesn't necessarily mean they're right; it just means there's a decision. The thing that's been, been different in business is there's no like governing body, right? And so if you have two partners, one person says this, one person says this, you'll fight for the rest of your lives because there's no like governing body. So I would say um, when you're looking for a business partner, make sure they have the opposite skills from you and they know that and they're comfortable with that. And then the second is, um, you know, have a partnership contract where it basically says like you get 51% decision making on these issues and you get 51% decision making and the other person's at 49%. And you can make it exactly equal. But if it comes down where we don't agree, because inevitably that will happen, that this person has the tie breaking vote and the other person just has to accept it and move on. Because if not, you'll get, you'll just get bogged down with conflicts that might not even matter. Right. So, um, so that's what I would say is my like advice for choosing a business partner and, um, you know, make sure you, you know, cause like the, it, shit gets real, you know, like more real than you will ever know. Um, for me, those things got pretty messy. Um, and I think that if, well, I know that if, if my, um, if people I knew had not invested in the company and I did not leverage my name, reputation, contacts, um, you know, expertise, whatever, if I didn't put my name on this thing, I should have walked away and said, go for it. You do that. You know, like it, it would have no, I have no skin in the game. Yeah. But, and like, I don't care about equity. Right. I mean, it was never about equity. It was never about money. None, none of that. It was about my reputation. Yeah. And it's funny because I'm circled back um, with, especially with my mom and dad, where my, where, I mean, this business almost destroyed me. I was like a shell of a human. No, like completely dis, like gave up my dream career, destroyed my relationship with my family interfered with my personal relationships and my personal life. Like it just like consumed me and it was a battle all the time. And I was like, I, I literally was like, I destroyed my entire life. You know, it was super dramatic. Um, and I circled back with my parents on that. And my mom has said like, you could have just, you know, sold it or shut it down or given it up. Like we, 
we didn't want you to destroy your life. Mm -hmm. And what I've said is like, that was an impossible choice for me. You were asking me to choose between my existence, you know, like, like what, what I was doing every day and my finances and my career and whatever. And on the other hand, my reputation. And to me, that is everything. Like my credibility, my reputation, my word. If I say I'm going to do something, like you invested in my company, I'm going to protect your money. I will do that. There's, I have never in my life set out to do something that I haven't done or that I haven't accomplished. And so I could never have decided between my, you know, what I thought my life was going to look like and my word because they were inextricably intertwined. So I made a lot of um, personal sacrifices and I did a lot of like soul searching on my identity because my identity was as a lawyer and my identity was not as a hospitality business person that that was my identity. I wasted a lot of money on law school. <laughs> you know, I could have just done that. So that was challenging and that almost like consumed and destroyed me. But I had to climb out of that because like, what else are you going to do? Lay down and die or you keep going, you know? So I dove in, I got to work. And to be honest, like I, I think that I thrive or um, stand up the most in times of crisis. And, um, and so for me, like COVID plus disastrous business partner situation was actually like my time to shine, you know? And I was like, you guys, I got this. And, and, and looking at my prior career, I think that's consistent, right? You go to trial, you're like going to war yeah. uh, and, you know, somebody's head gets blown off and everybody else is like, oh my God. And I'm like, no, I know what to do, you know? And so I think that for me, that was like ignited whatever fire in me that I needed to like keep going. Um, and I was like, you guys, I got this. And we accessed PPP money. We, you know, got all the legal documents squared away. I created a team. We really dove into um, the production, manufacturing, production, and distribution. I learned how to cook. I learned how to make cider. I learned. How I, I think that's an important dis thing to pause on, Lara, because up until this point, you were not the cider maker, right? Like you didn't know how to make cider, and this is your primary product. I mean, when you told me this story, and you're like grabbing one of the girls, you know, that worked, and you're like, "We're going to figure this out." And then, yeah, talk about briefly. I mean, you went across the pond <laughs> to find the best apples in the world because you were so passionate about that. Yeah, so um, so again, I, whatever, whatever that moment happened that ignited in me the passion to like get it done, that happened. And so as soon as the business partner left and I knew that he wasn't coming back, I changed all the branding to Women Power. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I was a, you know, I grew up a, a feminist, but I was a women's studies major in college. I was president of the feminist forum in law school. I planned the women's month events at the U.S. attorney's office for all those years. Um, and so I always joke, like, no matter what business I was in, it was going to be a feminist business of some sort. And so I'm like, craft cider, feminist craft cider, you know? <laughs> um, so I changed all the branding to women powered and um, the reason that came to me is that in this industry, first of all, business and specifically business in San Diego, um, this is maybe like the, sorry to say this, but the most sexist place I've ever experienced. Mm -hmm. I have, I have never in my life, and don't forget, you know, I had a decade as a federal prosecutor walking into courtrooms where federal judges look to me for guidance and legal authority and, you know, take my opinion as, or my, my statements as fact that will go down on a record somewhere. Like I am used to um, respect and I'm used to my resume, my credibility, my reputation meaning something. Yeah. And coming back to San Diego and being in the business community, general business community, I have never been mansplained so much in my entire life. I mean, it's, I, I've just never experienced anything like it. It's completely crazy. Just absolutely dismissive of like, anything I did previously. And 
so many people did that where they'd be like, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know math. You don't know science. You don't know whatever. And I was in, I believed it. Like that's what honestly, I think cut me down in those first few years between the business partner and like other random people in the business community that I had to do business with. They were like, you can't do this. You don't know this. You're from a different industry. So you might have had relevant experience in the law, but it's totally inapplicable to your little girl and you don't know what you're doing. And I was like, I guess I don't know what I'm doing, I guess. And I, it like upon reflection, it's so opposite of my personality and yeah. like, how the story people like don't believe it. But when people are telling you over and over, like you don't know something, eventually you just go like, I guess I don't know that, you know? And, and of course, like I was never a math and science whiz, which is why I went to law school. And so it just kind of fit into my like notions about myself. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was like, okay, I guess I don't know what I'm doing. I guess I don't. And, and my gut was like, I think I know what's right. I think I know what to do in this moment. I think I can handle this. And, and people were just like, you can't. And, and I was like, huh, okay. And so I had like had a few cider makers that got poached by companies that had more money or that left for other opportunities or whatever. And you know how business is like, it's just crazy. Um, and I was like, if I don't learn this stuff, I am going to be beholden to someone, whether it be employees, whether it be other businesses, whatever, for the rest of my life. And I'm like, I got to learn this. And I'm like, I talked to another brewery owner. I talked to my dad. I talked to all these people. And I was like, I think I got to learn how to make cider. And <laughs> I am telling you, everybody was like, you can't, you cannot, you large worm. Why? Not, I, again, <laughs> At the time, I was like, huh. And I'm like, man, I've met a lot of brewers in San Diego. And no offense, but they, <laughs> they weren't like the, rocket scientists. They, it wasn't, you know, I was like, it is science, but it's not rocket science. Right. <laughs> and I was like, man, am I like told I, I'm like, I don't know. And I and I just thought, like, I've got to try at least. Yeah. And um, there is one brewer in San Diego who I like will owe my life to forever because he walked in at this critical moment where I had like lost a, a cider maker. And I was like, I got to clean the, I got to learn this today. Like not kidding today. And so he walks in, we had a meeting on something else. And I go, I got to learn how to clean tanks this weekend. And he was like, oh, I could teach you that. And I was like, oh, cool. He's like right now. And I'm like, yeah, that'd be, I got to do it like Sunday, like, and it was Thursday. And he was like, yeah, okay, like, let's go. We walk into the bath. I pull out my Apple iPhone notes and I'm like, literally taking notes. Like this chemical is this, you leave it in there for this many cycles. This is how you turn on. This is a tri clamp. This is a hose. I mean, day one of like brewing. So he taught me the whole thing in about four hours. And, um, he goes, and, and this is, you know, again, I, I will love him for the rest of my life. He goes, I could come and help you, but I really think you should do it by yourself. And yes. I will come and check <laughs> to make sure you did it right. But I really think it'll be like good for you to like have to figure it out. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, great, let's do it. So Sunday, you know, four days later, I came in and cleaned. And if you see our big tanks, like yeah. it was, it's a real legit thing. Like I yeah. have some yes. funny pictures, like one day, like it's not a wine barrel. This is no. like Florida. Yeah. Just exploded yeah. out the top. And I like yeah. called my parents yes. on FaceTime and there's like, you know, cider all over the ceiling. And I was like, I'm like, I don't know if I'm doing it right. You know, but anyway, so he came on that day at the end of the day, he checked all the things and he goes, yep pretty good. Just look out for this, look out for this, whatever. I was like, okay, cool. Next step, yeah. fermentation, you know? <laughs> and then I have this picture of me and I'm, like, I had, you know, a few sort of marketing girls working with me and I have this picture of us and we're pumping juice. We've got this, you know, long hose through the whole brewery and it's me and four women just like holding this big hose, pumping juice. And we're like, we're doing it, you know? And I'm like, this is women powered. This yes. is, we're going to freaking figure it out. And what else are you going to do? Because the yeah. alternative is that you quit, you know? Yep. Yep. And so um, I was, I listened to chemistry podcasts when I was like falling asleep at night. And I, I learned all this stuff. And it, I, I do say this a lot. 
I am so much smarter now than I ever was as a lawyer. Mm. Because as a lawyer, you are taught, you know this, and you do not opine outside of your field of expertise, because that leads to trouble. You only have to know the things that you are an expert on. I always joke, like if we really make it, then we go on this, like how I built this podcast or like the (laughs) Selena Hansen podcast um, that I will say, you know, we were in Whole Foods, we were in Total Wine. I mean, we were, we were distributed in San Diego, Orange County, LA, all of Arizona. And I was like, Googled, not joking. How do you make cider? (laughs) And like, I, I, I watched YouTubes. I went to YouTube university and that process of learning that was a full on turning moment, not only in my business, but in my life. Um, because you, you kind of get to this point and you're like, I did that, you know, I, and, and I use this, um, I use this word that I, I came up with it at the time and it's unfuckwithable. <laughs> and I just felt like, yeah, I'm unfuckwithable because <laughs> you present a challenge to me and I'm going to overcome it. And, and learning science you know, was like a, was like a no-go for me. And I did it and we learned everything. And then I had this, um, you know, 22 year old bartender and he was watching me and like the girls, you know, go through with these big hoses and he goes, Hey, I'm kind of interested in learning. I'm like, great, let's go, you know? And, um, and so we had sourced this apple juice from the UK and I knew that it was, we were getting this like finest cider apple in the world. And I knew we were using premium products. I knew we were making a good, you know, a really good product. And I knew we were telling a really good story. Cider is, and I always use this phrase, but cider is as approachable as beer, but as nuanced as wine. And as I really dove into it, I was like, this is actually like an amazing product with a ton of history and culture. And like, somebody needs to be telling this story. And at my core, I'm a storyteller. That's my skill, right? It's trial lawyer, it's marketer, it's branding. That's my skill. And so I was like, we need to be really telling this story. So I looked at this kid who was helping me, you know, make cider. And I said, do you want to go to England? And he was like, yeah. (laughs) And I was like, let's go to England. So me and him went to England and I was kind of like waiting to see, you know, would he would he dive in and really be interested in the history, the culture, the science? You know, if you say you're interested in something, you need yeah. to show me, right? And and I always say, like, my I'm not for everybody. Bivouac as a as a place to work or whatever is not for I mean, Bivouac, the hospitality concept is for everybody. We're we have a diverse clientele and I love welcoming everybody into the space. But in terms of me and my personality and who I am as a business person or who I am as a boss or any of those things, like I am not for everybody because my standards are up here. And like, I I hold everybody to those standards without regard to any other factor. And not everybody likes that, you know? Um, But it's all with the goal of making us the best. It's all with the goal of being unfuckwithable, right? So I took this kid with me to England and I watched him just like be so interested in every part of it, soaking up knowledge like a sponge, really diving in. And we came back from England and I was like, you want to be the cider maker? And he was like, yeah, I'm like, great. And so then me and him literally learned absolutely everything together. We just went to Spain um, a few weeks ago to learn about Spanish cider and you know again to take lessons from the history and the culture Mm -hmm. um I always say that something that San Diego does really well is takes traditional things and then breaks all the rules and then comes out with a rad product that's what we did with craft beer that's what we've done with extreme sports that's what we've done with fusion cuisine and so that's our approach to cider at Bivouac is to learn all the rules. So we know what, what the history is, what the culture is, what the right way to do things is, what the science is. And then let's break the rules and do something cool. Um, so that's Jordan. And he's now my cider maker and has been for, for a number of years. And then, um, you know, I've just, ever since then, um, kind of the business partners now been gone much longer than he was here. And anybody that works here has never met him, doesn't know anything about him. And I 
you know, it's, I don't even talk about him. Um, it doesn't even come up, honestly. And we've been a, a women powered organization for so long, like that's kind of what Bivouac is known for. So I don't think about it unless somebody asks me like, which people do a lot, how'd you get into this? <laughs> you know? And I go, well, that's a long story. <laughs> but um, but I, I do believe the universe has a path and that things are presented for a reason. Well, you know, I don't think everything happens for a reason, but I do think the universe, you know, has a path and you have a choice all the time. Somebody said to me last week, if I'm not changing it, I'm choosing it. Mm. Um, and so uh, about two years ago, I would say we'd come through COVID. We we're growing production and distribution. Jordan was my cider maker. We're coming out with all this rad stuff. Our brand is really cool. We're in you know, even more stores than before. And we were, I would say thriving. And I was like, having a good time, you know? And, um, and then we needed more production capacity. And the space next to me became available. And in commercial real estate, that's pretty rare that the space right next to you would be um, available. And once you lose it, it's gone. Yeah. So, you know, if somebody else signed a 10 year lease on here, that's my last opportunity. Yeah. So we had looked at some spaces that were more affordable for manufacturing, um, but we, I was like watching all these breweries kind of implode or, or having mm -hmm. not, you know, trends change and the tanks are too big and all this stuff. And I was like, I really don't want to get into that situation. I was like, what if I could build a manufacturing facility right next to my original facility, but build a front of house concept that mitigates the cost of the building to manufacture so it's not a totally sunk cost and we double down in our community and in our concept and like just say like this is the bivouac the place of indoctrination we can educate people on cider we can educate people on our you know on feminism <laughs> or we can educate people on our outdoor action adventure brand um, and really create like a cool community space um, and, and North Park is such an amazing place to do business. Like the neighbors are really supportive and our target consumer is here for sure. So I went to my family and I said, there's this space next door. And I think that I'd like to sign a lease on it. And they were like, what, like, <laughs> are you crazy? This is your opportunity. Just like sell it and move on. You can go back yeah. to being a lawyer. Like you hate this, you know, <laughs> why are you doing it? And I was like, well, I've evaluated this. I put five years of my life into it. I have still, you know, my name's all over it. Um, and I, what would I do if I was a lawyer? Like right now I make zero dollars, <laughs> which is less than ideal, I can tell you. But if I made, if I was a lawyer and I made a million dollars, what would I do with a million dollars? I would live in San Diego near my family, which I do. I would hang out with my dog, which I do. I would paddleboard and hike if I had the opportunity, which I do, except for now it's a part of my job, you know? <laughs> and, um, and I would like hang out with young people and eat and drink good stuff, which I do as my job. So a um, million dollars would be cool, but I just don't know what, like, what money would do for my life that would, if I'm already living this, this life. And I've invested so much of my time and effort and energy. And like, I really think we're onto something, you know, I really do believe in cider. I really do believe in bivouac. I really like think the brand that we've grown and the community that we've built is something super special and super unique and does not exist in the world of craft, honestly. Mm -hmm. Um, like this outdoor action adventure lifestyle brand and the people that we're talking to, like when people come into Bivouac, I call them Bivouac super fans. They're like hanging on our every word. And they're like, oh my God, they came out with this new thing. I mean, they, they really, really love us. And that is something that is special, you know? Yeah. And I just think what a shame to have invested all of my self, my soul. <laughs> like every glass of Bivouac, you are drinking a piece of my soul. <laughs> For real. <laughs> and like, I've invested all this time, effort, energy, money, all the things into it. Do I really want to give up now or do I want to like give it a shot? Yeah. And they were like, sounds crazy, but okay. <laughs> you know, and unfortunately I'm like super convincing. And so 
I have a, I, it's almost like a, a, a power that I can use for good or evil. And like, I never know which one is happening at the moment that the words are coming out of my mouth. Cause I'm like, do I want to convince them or do I want them to talk me out of this? Because this is crazy, <laughs> you know, but I'm excitable. And so I get people around me excited, you know, I'm like, yeah, cider. They're like, yeah, a cider. You know? <laughs> so, um, so they were like, okay. But unfortunately the thing that I did was I removed all possibility of me blaming this on other people. <laughs> now when I'm miserable I'm like I have no one to blame but myself because I had the opportunity to get out and but Laura it. you're not miserable <laughs> thank you for reminding me that. it depends on the day it depends on the day I understand I understand well you took a, yes a huge risk in converting this uh former dance studio that just you know was nothing into this amazing just like it takes your breath away when you walk in I mean you did such an amazing job and I remember we walked through when it was just all like steel beams and you were showing me around you're like here's where this is gonna be and everything you said and that was like nine months before you opened is just like perfection Laura like everything is just so well thought out and so uh you know it's really built, as you said, for the community. And when I come in there and we bring groups of women in there and, you know, it, it just like perfection, just stunning, like such an amazing job. And where you are now is your super secret speakeasy <laughs> <laughs> that is so secret that no one ever sees it. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> Here, this is your only shot to see it. <laughs> yes, exactly. Which is again, perfection, like just every thought when you describe like where you bought the products and, or, you know, the, the imagery and the furniture and just the thoughtfulness that went into everything. It's just absolutely like blows me away every time I go in there. So, wow. Like it's such an amazing brand, such a great product. You are such an amazing leader here in San Diego. And I know if you want, this will double, triple, 10X itself in, in no time at all. Well, I, I hope that to be true. I mean, the thing that I think is the most rewarding for me is connecting with people like you who have the same exact vision. Um, you know, we met through my mom, of course, which like my mom knows everybody um, and you know everybody and I know everybody. So we it was <laughs> fate that we came together. Yes. Um, but your vision was the same. It's like, we have a lot of cool women in San Diego. We got a lot of hustlers. We got a lot of people doing stuff, but it's really hard to find support. Yeah, It is really hard to find like a network of people that you just totally trust and can be yourself and be honest around and ask advice. Cause like, this is hard. This is yes. like so, so hard. And, um, so what you built in the same way was, was for the same reason, right? Yeah. Like we need this. And, um, you know, I keep saying recently, especially about the Bivouac Adventure Lodge, like if you build it, they will come because like you said, I built all these million concepts and they're all crazy and diverse and intentional and whatever. But then I look around and people are using the space in the exact way that I wanted them to. And I think, dang, if you build it, they will come. If you feel like there's a need for your thing, which, you know, and, and I always talk to, um, people about raising money or about building brands or whatever. And the, the first thing that you have to say is what is the problem, right? What is the void that you are filling? And you did that with Hera Hub. What is the void? There's a bunch of women out there that need to get together and like they're hustling, but they're like, they need some support because it's yeah. freaking hard, you know? Yeah. And for me, I think there is a, a huge problem in society that we do not have a gluten-free craft beverage that is well-made, that is, uh, you know, targeted for outdoor action adventures, that is, um, you know, middle of the road amount of alcohol that can be drank casually or that can be drank fancy, that's good for people with um, uh, sophisticated palates, but can be consumed in a, in a casual way. And that's my need for the world that Bivouac is filling. Um, and, and from there, every single thing that I do and every single thing that Bivouac does is identifying the need, whether it be in the community, whether it be a friend that has a need, what, you know, whether, whatever it is, what is the need and how do we fill it? And when you do that, if you're, if you're in, in tune with the universe, 
like, you know what the world needs and you can give it to them. So, um, you know, thank you for being an inspirational leader, because as you know, there are down times. And every time I'm like, this is it. Today's the day I quit. And you're like, no. And I'm like, I'm so miserable. You're like, you're not miserable. <laughs> like, shut up. <laughs> My mom's always like, stop whining and go to work, you know? <laughs> and at the end of the day, it's kind of like what you got to do. You just got to, um, you know, I, that, that, that concept of unfuck with the I always come back to it. And I think, um, I am totally fuck with the bull. Like there's, like totally, totally, you can fuck with me, you know? <laughs> and people do every day. Like every layer of people that I deal with every single day, they fuck with me. Mm -hmm. And I could either lay down and die or you dust yourself off and keep going. And and I always say there's no difference between Bivouac and other any other brand or any other business or anything, except for I will not lay down and die. If I said I'm going to do something, then we're going to do it. Amazing. Amazing. Well, you have created such a remarkable business and brand, Lara, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to get to know you and share a bit of your story. Okay. Short story long, like, yes. I, you know, yes. but thank you for being interested and, and thanks for all of your work in the, the community, especially of women entrepreneurs. We need you. Well, I have your bacon and I'm taking you some chicken.